Good morning. Welcome to St. Michael and All Angels on this wonderful Sunday as we worship together. For those of you joining us online, I hope you will download today's bulletin so you can join us in all of our prayers and our singing. And this morning, we are very pleased to welcome our Bishop, George Sumner, Bishop of Dallas, here with us this morning. Now, standing as you are able, please join in our opening hymn. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time, I would invite all children to the back of the church where they're going to head off to Sunday school.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scripture to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated to hear God's word. A reading from the prophet Daniel. The Lord spoke to Daniel in a vision and said, at that time, Michael, the great prince, the protector of your people shall arise. There shall be a time of anguish such has never occurred since nations first came into existence. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky and those who lead many to righteousness like stars forever and ever. The word of the Lord. Every priest stands day by day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God and has since then been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. By a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. 
My friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith that our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. Let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise you, Lord Christ. be seated. Good morning, St. Michael's. It is a delight for me and for Stephanie, who's two-thirds of the way up on the right here, uh, for us to be with you this morning. It's a delight to be worshiping. Uh, It's always a delight to be worshiping inside with humans nowadays. That's always great. Uh, It's a delight to be here. And uh, before I proceed, I want to just say thank you to all of you collectively and individually for your 
flexibility and perseverance and faithfulness in what has been the weirdest year and a half of modern church historical memory. I'm uh, grateful to uh, Father Chris for his leadership and your team. Uh, we, are, we are getting through it all faithfully, and, uh, and I think all of us are learning anew uh, what the Lord has to teach us about, about being church. Before I proceed, I have a couple of special thank yous. As soon as Father Grosso got here, we started borrowing him. So that's, uh, and that was a good idea on our part. Uh, so he's helping with uh, ordinance and our service for the convention. Uh, so you all are helping us in a, in a myriad of ways. I want to thank uh, Deacon Jennifer Smith, who's here today. She's a deacon and a doctor and has been helpful for more than a year. We did a year of confirming outside, which was fun and always an adventure. And she helped make that possible. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus refuses to behave. Again and again in history, his followers have tried to fit him into their own reasonable plot line narrative by which they strove to lead their lives. And again and again, Jesus gave his guards the slip. The great example of this was the 19th century when he was enlisted as a representative of cultural progress in the West in contrast to the developing world which was being brought along. Then came the disaster of the First World War in which the so-called developed nations sent their mostly Christian men, young men, to slaughter one another across the trenches for no discernible reason. And there ensued a decade, the Roaring Twenties, of nihilism and decadence and confusion and religious rediscovery. Maybe Jesus was stranger than they thought. Maybe his message could not be easily assimilated into our assumptions. And at the heart of this rediscovery then, always, now, at the heart of the rediscovery was the end of the world. For it was part of the Bible that was awkward, perhaps popular for kooks, quickly overlooked. In the wake of the trauma, however, when the old assumptions were no longer workable, readers of the New Testament could see that it was plainly true that Jesus believed in and acted on the assumption of the end of the world and the coming kingdom of God. These could no longer be airbrushed away. Now, two of the key parts of the New Testament having to do with the end of the world were read in our service this morning. In the last chapter of the book of Daniel, written several centuries before Jesus, after fierce opposition, deliverance finally comes for the people of God. And then in the 13th chapter of the gospel according to St. Mark, Jesus himself is preparing his disciples for the travail to come in the days before the travail of his death. The things foretold in Daniel are now coming upon the earth, says Jesus. Both passages share some assumptions. The world is spinning out of control. Evil actors seem to have lead parts. Not hard to buy those ones. But in fact, God has the world in hand. We must be patient. Disaster is, is a battle of good and evil on a cosmic scale. And while for a time evil increases, God wins the victory in the end. Then we will see what the, um, then we understand things that we thought were meaningless suffering to actually be what Jesus calls the birth pangs of the new world. But in supposedly normal times, we suppress this knowledge. Maybe because these times have not been normal, we can retrieve it. And Jesus brings what he has to say to the fore of our mind. Today's readings have to do with the end of the world, a belief which is actually at the heart of Christianity. And so we must hear its news as pertinent to us, as news of the end of our world. The heart of the news of the end of the world is this. You and I will surely die, 
In fact, not once, but three times. Or a Christian understanding of death says three things to us, and all of them have to do with death. To understand the first thing it says, I want you to think with me about Sir Edmund Hillary, first man to reach the peak of Mount Everest with his Sherpa Tenzing Norgay. What was the end of Edmund Hillary's life? Depends on what you mean by an end. If it means where your life was headed, the end of the road, the top of the climb, then Hillary came to his end in 1953, I don't know how many feet above sea level in Nepal, in the thin air of Everest, though he would live on bodily for half a century. The New Testament at his heart is telling us that the end, which includes the goal, the purpose, the last chapter, death and all that is beyond, happened in Jesus of Nazareth, his death and resurrection. That is a weird claim that the end of all things happened in the middle of the story. In other words, both the passage of Daniel 12 and Jesus' own words in Mark 13 describe his own struggle with the forces of evil, his death, and his restoration to eternal life by the Spirit. Daniel thought it would come immediately and it pertained to the whole world. But it occurred first to Jesus, and someday to the world as a whole as well. His death was not defeat as it seemed by the forces rebelling in the world, but his own, in his own body, dying and being raised, occurred the birth pangs of the new world. And we believe that this Holy Spirit has invited us into his risen life. We have by faith been given a share of that. And that means that his end, purpose, death, new beginning, birth pang is also happening in us. The New Testament takes this claim literally and so should we. That is what it means to move past the avoidance of Jesus and his end of the world claim. Gospel as good news includes the news about the end of the world. And as such, it has three things to say to you and me personally. Three news of our end. And the first one has to do first of all with Jesus. The passages Daniel and Mark are first about Jesus and then as a result about you and me. The world will indeed end for each of us. The stars in the most personal way will fall from the sky. The last enemy, as Paul says, will prevail in that moment. The temple of my body will be thrown down, no stone left on another. Gospel includes memento mori. Your death and mine should lend seriousness and urgency to our listening, avoidance a doomed strategy. But the word gospel means good news, and in this case, no stone of mine left on stone is heard after we have heard also that when you and I pass into oblivion, the one already dead, and behold, he lives, Jesus, already at my side, reaches out his hand to me. Which leaves your and my third death. What could that be? Be it by ice or fire, a bang or a whimper, an end will come upon the world and all its people, as both Daniel and Mark say, and so does science for that matter. But here the Bible has more to say. That destruction is not just a terrible solar flare, nor just utter cold, but the action of the Lord God himself. And we are part of the race that comes then to an end. The story of humanity is also our story, the story of the world, a story of which we are a part. And that end, we are told in today's word of God, is also a beginning as well. The birth pang of the new world, 
All raised, said Daniel, to stand before the Lord in glory or condemnation. Then what is now seen by you and me only darkly in a glass will be seen face to face. Adam dies, that means all of us, his final death, of whom we are children. And the new Adam into which you and I have been invited springs to life. In other words, there really will be an end of all things and the whole world really is a creature just as you and I are. And these prophecies of doom and resurrection will come to pass on the widest imaginable tableau. What does the news of your and my three deaths contribute? The one shared by Jesus means gratitude in the midst of whatever travail you and I now are working through. That most personal and individual death awakens us to spiritual urgency and listening. These words pertain to us and in an ultimate way. And as we awaken, the third death summons us to hear what the Bible has to say seriously for the world, mortal as it is as well. All three will in the end prove doorways to the same place where Jesus is, whom C.S. Lewis says is good but not safe, whom Revelation says is the same, Hebrews says the same forever, Revelation says do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and see, I am alive forever. And I, Jesus, hold the keys of death and hell. Amen. Now I invite you all to stand. And joining with Christians around the world, let us profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to ju judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church and the world. In peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone, for this community, the nation, and the world, For the just and proper use of your creation. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For, those who are sick, and needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who and all who seek you. For Justin, Archbishop, Archbishop of Canterbury. Michael, our presiding bishop, George and Michael, our bishops, our parish clergy and their families, for the vocations ministry, the real estate advisory committee, and for all bishops and other ministers. 
for the special needs and concerns of this congregation. We pray for all those on the St. Michael prayer list and for Brian Bongiorno, Terry Dimler, Carol Imperial, Bruce Pingree, Alexandra Pingree Smith. Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We give thanks for the joyous birth of Davis Everett Charhon. We will exalt you, O God, our King. We pray for all those who have died, especially Anne Anderson, Martha Louisa Parker Deaver, Patricia Gewertz, Pearl Ann Weibolt Sepp, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now kneeling as you are able, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace. Well, good morning, everyone, once again. Glad that you are here to worship with us this morning. If you are new or visiting with us this morning, please know you are very welcome. We would love to get to know you better and to connect you here at St. Michael. And so I want to encourage you to grab the card that you can find in the pew back in front of you. Send us your contact information either there or visit our website, stmichael.org, and we will be in touch to help connect you here to this congregation. And if you have prayer requests, you are invited to submit those prayer requests on those cards, and we will pray for you this week as well. Looking ahead, there are a number of things that we have going on here at St. Michael, but before we get to a few of those announcements, a special word of welcome to our Bishop George Sumner and our Deacon Jennifer Smith, who is here with us this morning. And this, the sixth anniversary of Bishop Sumner's consecration here as the Bishop of Dallas. So we're very glad to share this day with him. Thank you for being here. And as a note, as we approach Thanksgiving and Advent, there are many things going on here at St. Michael, and I want to make sure that you will plug into those. First off, on Sunday, November 28th, we will have our Advent Festival here. That's the first Sunday of Advent. And you're invited to join us here for a special service in the evening. We'll make Advent wreaths together in the Garden Cloister. There's an outreach project, especially for our teens who need some outreach hours. You can meet St. Nicholas. So if you've got young children in your life, you can meet St. Nick and take some pictures. It's a big, fun evening. And so do mark that the Sunday after Thanksgiving to join us here as we kick off Advent. And there are many ways that you can give and make an impact in our community through outreach here at St. Michael. And two of our big Christmas projects, I Believe in Angels and Heart of Giving, have already kicked off. And we will have representatives at tables in the hallways throughout the building today. And we encourage you to participate in those good ministries as we help meet the needs of our neighbors here in Dallas and beyond. And lastly, a note that 
Today's offering goes to support the bishop's ministry. So all the loose plate offering that you make today will help support the ministry that Bishop Sumner does here in Dallas and throughout the Anglican communion. And so please be generous. Now, today is also birthday Sunday. So if you have or will celebrate a birthday in November, I invite you to stand so we can say a special prayer of blessing over you. I know some of you were born in November. Come on, there we go. If you turn in your bulletins to the bottom of page eight, I invite you to pray along with me for all of our friends who will celebrate birthdays this month. Let us pray. Watch over your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts, may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of their life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. And now let's continue our worship. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right to give thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. <clears throat> On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor, and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Hallelujah. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take the remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. God.